All right, you guys, I've been waiting for a while to start filming my review of the finale of Alone Season 9 because it wouldn't stop raining, which is amazing because this is August in the Great Basin Desert and that doesn't happen here. So super, super cool. And it means that now it's overcast. And if it doesn't keep raining, I get to actually film in the garden, which is normally very difficult to do during daylight hours because it is so freaking hot and bright that it's not good for filming. So <laughs> that said, really, really excited to talk about the finale, the big one on season nine of Alone. I was worried that there might not be that much to talk about on this episode because it's down to just a few people and there's not a lot going on usually as it winds down, but there's actually a lot of great things to talk about. I'm gonna look at the different strategies of all three of the folks still out there and how they represent kind of a gamut of survival strategies. Gonna be talking a lot again about the mental game, about the real particularities of the physiology of some of the strategies we're seeing. And of course, a lot to say about out being out when it's really cold weather and after being out for so long under such extreme circumstances. Cross your fingers with me that the weather holds <laughs> and that I'll get to finish filming this and let's dive into talking about episode 11 of season 9 of Alone. I feel like these three really represent kind of three extremes of survival strategy with Juan Pablo very extreme of absolute energy conservation, really doing almost nothing so that he can keep all of those calories in his body. And then we see Carrie Lee, who's being super active. She's doing a lot of things, giving it her all, being very active, going out in storms, doing projects that she doesn't have to do for the enjoyment of it, filming herself having snowball fights and being silly and creative and playful. And then Timogen kind of in the middle where he's definitely not fully conservative, but he's definitely conserving his energy and kind of doing the minimum that he has to, to still keep all of his normal systems functioning, but not going that extra mile like Carrie Lee is. And we're seeing how each of those strategies is playing out for them as we wind down to the end of their time. Our first scene is of Timogen, and it seems really clear that his body is winding down. And we've been seeing this trajectory with him for a while. It's been kind of a slow fade for Timogen. We're really seeing it in his face, his cheekbones, his jaw structure is all becoming more and more stark, right? It's really popping out. And in this episode, I feel like we're really starting to see it in his body language, in his bearing as he's out there walking through the woods. He's taking short steps. He's looking a little awkward, a little clumsy. We see him sliding on the snow a bit. You can just really see that just getting to the basics, firewood and drinking water is about all he can manage. And he says it himself in this scene. He says, you know what? I think one load of firewood is about all I can do. And then as he's back in his tent, he says, yeah, 40 minutes. That's basically a full work day for me right now. Right? So his body really doesn't have very much left to give. At this point, Timogen, he says it, he's running on heart, running on mental fortitude, but his body's clearly about done. And he's a doctor. He knows this, he gets it. He's paying very careful attention. And we've been hearing this in his narrative all along. And he's really getting to that point of decision-making on this episode and in this scene. Contrasting that with Carrie Lee, who's out there staging a snowball fight with herself and playing both sides. Really creative, really fun. She's obviously having a great time, right? Finding ways to keep herself entertained and amused and really enthusiastic about still being out there. She talks about how even though she's one of the older participants on Alone, she doesn't feel old, right? She still feels like a kid in a body that's just older. And this is gonna come into play as we get towards the end of this episode in a really beautiful way. We then see Carrie out stalking in the woods, trying to get a squirrel. And this also really exemplifies that strategy where she is just energy. She is just going for it. Something like walking around snowy woods through deep snow when her body is this wasted for something as small as a squirrel. This is not a great calorie strategy, right? She is very likely to be spending more calories than she's bringing in just by that walk. And when we're talking about something that like a squirrel where they're 
fast moving, deep snow right now makes shots harder. And it means that the squirrels can disappear into the snow, even if you hit them, really easy for them to disappear under the snow and you not be able to retrieve them. So it's one of those things where mentally, emotionally, it feels good to be doing something for herself, but calorie wise, probably not the best choice but she's out there, she's doing it anyway, and she sees a squirrel and she decides to take a shot. Now, this is a very risky shot on so many levels. One, she is already weak and her aim is already slipping. So that makes it less likely. She's also shooting up, which is a harder shot. And it also means it's really hard to track where your arrow is going. And then there's deep snow and thick woods. So as soon as I saw her getting ready to take that shot, I thought, oh, there goes that arrow because it is a long shot that she's going to get anything. And chances almost nil that she's going to find that arrow in deep snow like that. And sure enough, that's what happens, right? She takes the shot and then she says, oh, I shouldn't have done that. Now, there's two ways of thinking, right? Definitely with a limited number of arrows, a squirrel per arrow is not a good equation, right? The chances of losing that arrow are so big and a squirrel's calorie input is so small. Had she been potentially trading an arrow and losing that arrow for a grouse or a hare, I would have said that was worth the trade-off of losing an arrow. But for a squirrel, I think not. That said, if she's aware that it's winding down towards the last of her time, what does she have to lose really, right? Going home with a few less arrows when you know you're probably going home anyway. And when that chance at food, however slight it might be, would do so much for you, for your body and the mental emotional of being able to eat again, eat something besides fruit leather, maybe it's worth it. Maybe she has done this equation in her mind and she's like, you know what? It's a bad shot and a high risk of losing it, but meh, I don't feel like I have that much to lose. So no big deal at this point. Then at the end of this scene, she says, wow, that squirrel, I can't believe that it showed itself to me. It was totally onto me, but that's what squirrels do. That's very much squirrel behavior. They are feisty little suckers, especially red squirrels. So even if they think that you're a danger to them and that you're shooting at them, they're not likely to run away because of it. They're likely to yell at you harder because of it. So I would say that wasn't the assessment of that squirrel's behavior that I would have had. Please subscribe to my channel, hit like if you enjoyed this review and hit the notifications bell if you'd like to hear when more of my videos are coming out. And invite you to join my Patreon team, which is what makes it possible for me to do all of these videos. And there are all kinds of awesome benefits that come with being a part of that. Skills related content, alone related content, interactive live calls, and a lot more. We see Juan Pablo talking about the wacky weather patterns out there. Thaw, freeze, thaw, freeze. They just had a lot of intense snow, really intense storm. And now he's laying there and it's rain hitting on his shelter, right? And he happens to be camped in the woods and ice falling from those trees, just absolutely catapulting right through his tarp. Now, here's the thing. Juan Pablo's strategy has been to be very energy conservative, but he is making himself so vulnerable having just bare tarp. I talked about this in the last one, how much heat he's losing through not having an insulated shelter. But now we're seeing another major liability of this shelter style, because not only is there no insulation, there's no padding, there's no protection for that tarp. Now, on prior episodes before the Alone Frozen season was announced, I had to say, geez, these tarps don't look very strong. Now I can say, I know these tarps because they're the same tarps that we were issued on Alone Frozen and they are so thin, truly. They are like garbage bags. They are the thinnest grade of commercial woven poly tarps I've ever seen. So they are so, so fragile. I had holes in mine basically from when I opened up the package. So to be banking on that tarp, being strong enough to stand up to weather unprotected like that was a huge risk for him. Had it been something like a canvas tarp or a reinforced tarp like we saw Adam bring as his extra item, that, yeah, maybe you could go ahead and trust that that was going to be able to withstand snow falling, ice falling, branches falling. But the tarp that Juan Pablo has, man, I think it was a bad idea for him to not put something on top of that to protect it. Some extra boughs, some branches, some moss, anything to just pad that tarp a bit. 
Again, Juan Pablo's whole strategy revolves around energy conservation. So maybe he did this on purpose. Maybe it was a calculated risk that he was willing to take. But I have to say, honestly, I'm surprised he doesn't have more than one big hole. I think that it would have been well worth putting the energy in to just even just throw some treetops against it, just something to protect that poor tarp. Had it gone on longer, had the weather stayed the way it is now with more ice falling into that tarp, it could have just been absolutely perforated and his whole strategy completely shot just because of not taking the extra afternoon to add some extra protection on top of it. That said, sweet patch job. I mean, doing all that with such minimal tools, just the split down innards of the paracord and snare wire and not being able to get outside of the tarp to sew back and forth, really pretty darn sweet job. So he made a choice that I think was a poor choice, but his ingenuity and resiliency made up for it. And now he's doing okay. So maybe it's working out and it's less energy than he would have spent had he fortified it. Who is to say, right? There are so many variables to consider. Back to Chimogen, and he said that he's getting weaker every day, and we can see it. He seems weaker and weaker in every scene. In this scene, he is going and getting water and chipping through the ice to get water. And I'm guessing that a lot of people are probably wondering about this. Why is he bothering to waste the energy to get that water when there's snow all around? The reality is it's actually kind of hard to melt snow for water. It's so light and fluffy that it really takes a lot of snow to get a decent amount of water. And it takes a long time for the heat to get into the snow and start to melt it. Melting snow goes fast if you've got some water already in your pan, but very slow if it's just snow. And you can actually scorch snow which is so weird and so counterintuitive. So I'm with Timogen that it is probably a better idea to take the effort to get into that water. And then once he has a bit of water, then it's gonna be very easy for him to maintain that water because he can just keep keeping more snow into it. And then it's gonna melt very quickly. So he doesn't have to keep making trips to that bit of stream and chipping through it. Good thing to know about efficient use of water versus snow in survival situations like this. Related to that is the idea of eating snow for water. And they're always saying in all of the survival literature that it's a bad idea to do it because it takes so much from your body to thaw that snow and to rewarm that tissue, much better to warm it outside of your body. So warming that water and drinking it warm, definitely a good idea. I think about this Juan Pablo and I worry about him when we see him drinking that water right out of the river. So really cold, just above freezing because his whole strategy is energy conservation. And yes, he's saving a lot of energy by not having fires in terms of not having to bring in firewood, not having to go to the effort, staying in his sleeping bag, which is keeping him really warm. But when he's drinking that cold water, that's gonna be sapping a lot of his body's calories. So, you know, where where is the equation? I think that he might lose less calories by putting in a little effort to have fires and heat up his water so he can drink it at body temperature. So much respect for Timogen and his choice about how he wants to go out and recognizing that he is really getting down to it. And he's at the point where he does not have very much left to give. And he has a choice. Do I want to give it all and put my body through the ringer and be taken out of here with potentially someone carrying my bags, potentially even on a stretcher? Or do I want to take that last percent and choose for myself how I go out? Do it on my own two feet, carrying my things myself and go out strong and empowered. And I am such a fan of making that choice said it in so many of these reviews and it was a pinnacle of my choice on season six i did the same thing and i said you know what i'm going to make the choice for myself and i'm going to go out carrying my bag on my own back i'm not going to go out so weak and wasted that they have to help me to the helicopter and haul my things for me so it was a real proud moment for me to heft that pack onto my own two shoulders and carry it to the helicopter and timogen is making that same choice he has got it 
cooler looking because he makes the little toboggan for him to haul his stuff himself up and out of the woods in that way. But a lot of respect for that choice and the wonderful modeling that it is on this show specifically, where a lot of people push themselves to the extreme and do damage for him to not just choose not to do that, but to go out on his own steam, right? Before his body is just totally tanked. So thank you, Timogen. And thank you so much for all of the heart that you brought. What an example of really leading with your heart. And I particularly loved him talking about the fact that his alone journey was so different than he pictured it was gonna be going in. And this to me is one of the most poignant things. So many people are really excited to be on alone and almost always across the board, it is such a different experience than people think that they're stepping into. A lot of people with a lot of ego talking about how they're gonna make it, they're gonna win, they have the skills, but you just don't know what is waiting for you when you step into the wilderness. And I think that coming in with humility and respect and curiosity about what's gonna happen rather than having in your mind that you know what's gonna happen and you're in charge of what happens is really, really huge. And I love that Timogen thought this journey was gonna be kind of around proving himself and instead seeing, wow, I've actually put too much energy in my life proving myself and pushing myself rather than leading with my heart and staying connected to those I love. What a beautiful take home message. So thank you for sharing that, Timogen. And I can't wait to hear how your journey affected your mom and your relationship with her. Best of wishes and so much gratitude for all of the things that you shared with the world through your alone journey. The reality is that it's really difficult to go through such an extreme journey without coming to this place of deep introspection and growth and healing. You come out of it changed. And if you don't, I think you're doing something wrong. I think you haven't been paying attention. You haven't really given it your all. And I think we're especially seeing that in the people who are out there for so long. I have huge respect for everyone who partakes on this journey, however long they stay, however they go out or choose to go out for themselves. But I think we really see it in the people who are out there for a long time and really push their bodies to the extreme, just that there is no way to get out of it without deep, deep change. And that I think is one of the most beautiful things about it. And then, oh my goodness, was anybody else blown away like I was to hear Juan Pablo say, this is the first fire I will be having in my wood stove, right? I mean, he built that wood stove, what was it? I think it was day eight. And here we are day 70 and he is firing it up for the first time. Okay, can you fathom the willpower that it took to go that long under those cold conditions with a wood stove right in the shelter with him and not to have fired it up. It's unbelievable. It is unprecedented in the history of alone. And as we see, his strategy worked for him, but I, I'm just blown away by his determination. Lots of people undertake this journey for very different reasons. Juan Pablo clearly was there to win. He had a very specific goal and he has enough experience and knowledge about this kind of experience to actually have a good idea of what that takes because he's done 100 days by himself in the wilderness. He and his partner did 180 days together in the wilderness. He has done this. He understands it from a scientific, a physiological, and an experiential level, which is really different than a lot of the folks out there who are like, ha, huh, this is an experiment. It's an experiment for him too, but it's an experiment he goes into with a fair bit of data. Absolutely agree with Juan Pablo that setting specific time goals so you have these milestones for yourself is really huge. I did this on season six where I would have a, a treat of pemmican on every 10 day mark, on the 40 day, the 50, the 60 and 70, I had something special for myself to celebrate that. Every Saturday was a celebratory day. I made it one more week. That is something to celebrate. So a milestone like day 70, I get to start having fires. That is huge. At the same time, holy cow, it's pretty shocking to me that it didn't occur to him that burning cans that he knew had paint in them 
was a bad idea. It wouldn't have taken that much for him to have a fire and burn those cans outside before using them to build that wood stove to make sure that he had burned off all of the toxins. This is a common thing. Even when you just buy single wall stove pipe from the store, when you first burn it and the paint burns off, it smells gnarly. You are not supposed to breathe that stuff. So paint cans with a lot of paint in them. Yeah, talk about toxic, super gnarly. Really fabulous that he was able to pull those cans out and replace them with clean cans. But also it sounds like he had those clean cans in, the, in reserve. So why in the world didn't he just build with the clean cans in the first place? Kind of stumped. The thing about Juan Pablo is when we see footage of him, to my mind, his face does not look anywhere near as drawn and haggard as the rest of folks, right? His cheekbones aren't standing out. He's skinny, sure, but he's not like skin and bone skinny. Another thing that we didn't really see in this episode is when he first undertook that fast, he said, I'm planning to fast for the next 20 days. He didn't say from here on out. So clearly he has some food stores, perhaps those fish that he just sat and looked at and couldn't eat. Maybe those are frozen solid in a puck in the back of his shelter somewhere. We don't know, but I'm really conscious of the fact that he said it was just a 20 day fast and we're beyond those 20 days now. I'm guessing that he's starting to eat again. And that's part of why we see him feeling a lot more energetic and starting to get out and do more in this episode. Juan Pablo points out that he's been very conscious of safety. He says, my safety is pretty much perfect. So rather than swinging his ax to break his kindling, he's placing it on there and whacking it with a mallet. So there's no risk of hitting off, whacking himself with it, his fingers being in the way. And this is a really important point because he's been talking about this all along, but when you're out there, not screwing up can be more key than doing some things right because injury is not just going to potentially take you out, but it's going to be a huge amount of your body's resources to recover from. Getting injured out there is gonna be such a big handicap. It's gonna mean you can't get out and get your water. You can't get out and get your firewood. Obviously food is nowhere near something that you're gonna be able to do if you have a severe injury out there. So just not screwing up, being really conscious of safety is so big and i feel like we often don't see that emphasized in a lot of survival stuff a lot of the images we have of survival and wilderness skills is like being tough and persevering and you know busting through the hardship and those can be really good ways to get injured so his conservative approach conservative on so many levels really wise really good modeling 